Thanks. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about trajectory optimization and control, also, of rigid body systems through contacts. So we have a probably a different, different twist on what you've been hearing. Uh, you know, I think what we've seen today is that trajectory optimization can play a really, really powerful role. It's, it's a very useful tool we have for, for motion planning. Uh, I want to think about the question again, how do we intelligently plan these trajectories through contact discontinuities? Right, so, so we thought we knew, uh, and then we were presented you know, about a year ago with this, this fast runner robot from the folks down at HMC. This is just a quick video of the leg. Uh, and this, this, you know, to, to phrase Russ, Russ, I think, rocked our world. Uh, this is a very complicated problem. Uh, and, and what we learned, I think, I would say the trajectory optimization as it stands right now uh, does not really scale to systems of this, this sort of complexity. I'll get into why in a second. Uh, what's the, the more traditional worldview here? I'm gonna look at a hybrid trajectory optimization problem. Uh, so say we had a swing and a stance phase, and we look at the continuous dynamics of the two different phases here. Uh, and then we have you know, some impulsive collision event that occurs in between them, and we'd optimize these two different, two different modes individually. Uh, and as part of this, we've come up with, with a sort of mode sequence. So for a simple walking gait, we go all the way from swing through toe off, and we'd specify this a priori, Speci uh, uh, optimize the modes individually. And, but then what happens when we get to something something more like fast runner? Now, uh, here we're looking at 22 discrete variables. That's in a planar model, contact points on the feet, as well as joint limits, which are very, very similar, uh, when, especially when you're con impacting these joint limits around contact with the ground. So instead of that nice, clean picture from before, we might have a very much more muddled mode sequence. Now it's no longer really obvious what a good, a good sequence is going to be. We want to be able to reason through contact. Instead of treating this contact as a, as a black hole uh, or a tunnel from one mode to another, we want to be able to reason through it. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of communities out there who thought a lot about the contact problem. Uh, I think graphics is one, certainly, simulation uh, and grasping. And, and no one really out there is looking at this in sort of a hybrid schedule or, or using springs. Uh, the idea is to treat these modes implicitly, so we can specify a set of constraints, non-penetration, a strict non-penetration, uh, as well as a complementarity constraint. Uh, and there, uh, there have been certainly recent applications with this sort of approach towards optimization and control. Uh, what we'd like to do here now is to fold the complementarity uh, into the optimization problem. I'm going to directly optimize over, over the state and control input, but as well as the contact forces. So they're now, those forces are going to be uh, optimization parameters in, in our program. Uh, and this becomes a, a DT system. So we're looking at discrete time only, uh, which works for us because the, the dynamics are not, uh, are not continuous anyway. Uh, the big takeaway is we don't have a mode schedule anymore. We don't really have any, uh, any real concept of mode. Everything is treated implicitly. This is a, just a look at what the, the resulting nonlinear program looks like. Uh, as you can see at the top, those lambda forces, you can read them. Those are the contact forces. They're now optimization parameters. We have dynamics and contact constraints. Uh, and of these, I'll just highlight one, which is the complementarity constraint. So if phi is our guard function uh, and lambda is our force, we have a complementarity, which is enforcing that we don't have uh, contact forces occurring at a distance. So uh, we're either in contact with the ground, with phi is zero, and we can have an arbitrary force uh, greater than zero, really. Uh, and if we're not in contact with the ground, we can't have, can't have a force. So the first system we looked at here is a spring from Ingo. Uh, we took a, a trajectory from, from Jerry and others and looked to reduce uh, mechanical cost of transport. Got a number down to um, 0.04, which is I think, similar to the mechanical COT uh, mentioned by the, the Ranger team. And the resulting uh, behavior looks a little something like this. It's a very lazy gait. See, uh, kind of <coughs> swinging that foot barely over the ground in order to, again, reduce, reduce COT. Uh, this plot here shows the, the mode sequence that emerges as a result of this. So uh, each of uh, four levels here is a, is a different mode per foot, with two contact points per foot. We have four modes on each foot. Uh, and, and we initialize our program with the, the red, so very coarse right-left motion, really giving very little information to the optimizer. Right? And what emerges actually is a distinct heel strike and toe off. Uh, so again, this, this mode was not given to the optimization procedure, and it all emerged rather, rather naturally. Uh, and then back to the system we were really, really originally motivated by is the fast runner. Uh, so we've kind of lost the intuition here for the modes. There's so many of them. Uh, but I think the takeaway here is that in the red and the blue, they're very different. We, we have almost no agreement between the initial trajectory, which came from IHMC, and our resulting optimized trajectory. So I think this is a, this is a hard problem, the, just the sheer combinatorial number of modes and trying to, to plan a trajectory through that. 
uh, and then the resulting gain looks like this. This is around uh, 20 miles an hour, again, with the cost, uh, the goal of reducing CO2. Uh, just to, to summarize briefly, uh, I think this is a very natural way to take the LCP and fold it into our optimization procedure. And we can synthesize very interesting, complicated gates without the requirement for a mode schedule. Uh, open questions. Uh, relaxation for the complement carrier conditions have been useful, so we've relaxed them and then tightened them down to a strict condition. Uh, this is pretty similar to, I think, what um, uh, Yuval was mentioning earlier. Uh, and uh, we would also like to look at extension to, to MPC as well. Uh, so with that, I'd like to open up for questions. We use SNOP, uh, so it's a general nonlinear optimization program, taking advantage of some of the sparsity that, that does exist the way we implement the problem. Did you experience any uh, irregularities uh, for uh, those the switching conditions? Uh, you mean the complementary conditions? Uh, in terms of like a local minimum being achieved, or uh, what do you mean? Numerical instabilities or unable uh, to find the uh, feasible regions. That, that does happen, and I think you can, um, using a, a good initial trajectory certainly helps guide, I mean, this speaks to the local nature of the problem, good initial trajectory. Um, that, that relaxation of the complementarity can help you avoid some of the numerical problems. So what we do is we relax it, run it, uh, and then tighten it back down to a strict feasibility to help, help, help avoid having nasty local minimum. Um, well, the gradient information comes from the way we write, we, we fold that in, so we take the, the complementarity constraints, the contact constraints, and put them as, you know, as constraints into our, into our program. So there is full grading information throughout, throughout the optimization. Here, the LCP formulation, it, it um, kind of merges the impulsive forces with your more steady state ground reaction forces. So if you do look at a time history of, of the contact force, there will be a large spike, yeah, uh, that kind of represents the impulsive event. Um, maybe, just general So here we're looking at you know synthesizing the trajectory as opposed to, to stabilizing it. Um, I think a question that was asked uh, earlier about robustness, um, which is certainly an issue. You could you can uh, you know try to address that through a cost function, for instance. Uh, and uh, actually, Hung Kai sitting over there has a poster session looking at uh, kind of robust trajectory optimization as well. Um, but it, you know uh, here we're looking at kind of splitting the, the control and stabilization versus the trajectory synthesis. A lot of the simulation people have uh, long done another method, which is uh, they just keep the contact with uh, strings and dampers layered to the ground. Mm -hmm. So uh, does this perform uh, much better than that? In, in order to use a, a spring and damper system, you have to have a very stiff spring to get any, any sort of realistic, uh, and which is not really a tractable uh, solution for, for trajectory optimization. Because uh, we like to hear to take kind of rather coarse DTs, I think, um, I think it was mentioned earlier, we have to take a rather coarse trajectory. Uh, if you have to have a very stiff system, you have to have a lot of time steps, and the, the problem quickly becomes intractable. And so maybe, I just a stupid topic, but uh, the, the, the last movie is showing the fast runner. Sure. It looked a bit uh, funny, uh, and, I, and I assume from the fast runner that it's really cost efficient and also stable, so why did you find uh, the node that's, that's, that's a good question. I, I'm, you know, to, to repeat it, why did we come up with an, our own trajectory here as opposed to the open loop one from HMC? Um, the goal is to do better, I think, than the, the open loop trajectory. Um, but that's a simple answer. I mean, the, the sine wave being open loop stable is fantastic and, and it's awesome. Uh, and we'd like to see if we can, we can beat that. And also, if you look at the movie, you see that the center of mass is a bit much to the front, so what did you say to follow forward? 
Ben? Why Justin? Uh, ben, I think that's a, just kind of a, a visual artifact. Um, if you, if I were to slow this down, you would see that when the foot is actually in contact in the ground, it, it is underneath the center of the mass. But there's some weight in the legs here, and, and but you know, if I were to slow down, that would be see all better. Last short question. I don't off the, off the top of my head, no. Sorry. Um, I think the IHS, you guys know kind of where they're at um, on their end right now. But. You know, it is. I, 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 I can get you the number later. But, uh, okay, so this concludes this session. Next time, our, all of our speakers again.